All right. Keely Henninger, welcome to the Single Track Podcast. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat. Cool. Well, uh, we're definitely going to talk all things Western states in just a minute, but wanted to get a little bit into your background and just other stuff you do in the community. Um, like one thing that really sticks out to me is, and I, I mentioned this to you offline, I think you have one of the most generous Instagram profiles out there. Like there always seems to be a nugget of like training or fueling or recovery wisdom in each post. And so maybe we start there. Um, you had a recent post, you said something like, uh, or no, it was about the work you do in research in addition to being an athlete. And I'm curious just for the audience, like, can you talk about maybe the top two or three takeaways that you've gotten from like the emerging science out there around our sport that you're applying to training blocks like Western States? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty tough question. I feel like there's nuggets that I come across every day that are, that you can kind of apply to our sport. Um, but I think some of the biggest takeaways actually are, are, are more broad than, than more niche, I'd say, because I'd say when I first started getting into the sport, I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I was overtraining a lot. I lost my menstrual cycle, all of these things. And, Mm. and as I started getting more and more into the science, I realized that a lot of women are experiencing this, but we, we don't have to, and that there's a lot of really negative health outcomes that actually can result from treating yourself this poorly and losing your menstrual cycle and all of that things. Mm. And so I'd say that's the biggest thing I've started, you know, incorporating into my training over the previous like two or three years is just acknowledging that you can do less and give yourself time to recover and actually treat your body correctly so that you can actually reach new potential, right? Like you can actually perform better than you thought you could when you were overdoing it. Mm. Um, and so I think that's a very big emerging field where a lot of new research units are going after these big health, um, discrepancies between male and females in the sport and really trying to advocate for, for females and males to start treating themselves better. Mm. And by doing so, hopefully reach new levels of performance. Um, but I'd say another thing that is really interesting to apply to ultra trail running is like all the fueling research that comes out with triathlon. Um, so there's not been a ton of fueling research in trail running. There's been a couple that have come out recently showcasing, you know, the benefits of fueling upwards of 120 grams of carbohydrates per hour and how mm. that can, you know, decrease muscle damage, improve recovery, improve performance. Um, but that's not super common in trail running. Most people you talk to, you know, eat one gel an hour or something and, yes. and you know, it's not their fault. That's what a lot of the companies are promoting. And so I'd say being able to, you know, firsthand increase the amount of fueling that I do during races and then feel the benefits, whether it's during a race or during my recovery post race or post long run is really cool. And then seeing that, how that's kind of translating into the community right now, where people are kind of realizing that they can fuel more and practice fueling more so that they have that advantage come race day. They don't find themselves like bonked on the side of the trail. Mm. Um, yeah. And then the third piece I'd say that's most prevalent for Western states is all the kind of research that came out around sauna training or heat training in relation to performance and how basically incorporating a sauna protocol or a heat training protocol. But, you know, typically for those of us who are living in colder climates, the sauna is the most realistic um, and how you can incorporate that for, you know, a couple of weeks before a race in order to kind of improve your body's ability to deal with that heat stress so that when you get to the race day, Uh, the heat doesn't impact you quite as negatively as it could. Awesome. Well, there's a lot there. We will have to do something long form (laughs) at some point because this is all fascinating to me. But I think one thing that you reminded me of with your first point there about overtraining, I think we talk a lot, especially in the ultra running media about all of the men over the years that have suffered from overtraining and that are either no longer in the sport because of it, or they're a shell of themselves. And I don't think that that same experience is talked about a lot or at least enough on the female side of the sport. And I'm wondering if you sense that same perception. I definitely do, but I almost want to counter that point and and say that it's probably not talked about on the male side enough either, at least not during the journey, right? Like we like to applaud toughness. We, We do a sport that really like invites people to really push themselves to their limit. And we like to applaud when people push themselves past that limit and we applaud toughness. We never really applaud someone's ability to back off before they've reached their limit. And so I'd say from a male and female lens, we we only get to see the beginning of that story where we see someone's really high level of success. We just assume that they're able to push through all this toughness. And then 
we don't really understand that that could have really detrimental effects later in life. And so, yeah, I think we're starting to talk about it and really start to emphasize longevity in the sport instead of, you know, having a couple of years of really phenomenal performances to not be able to run again a couple of years later. And so mm. I think hopefully from both a men's and female like athlete perspective, that's starting to change. And like, instead of applauding someone's ability to persevere through unnecessary suffering, we start applauding someone's ability to, to pull the plug, mm. um, or, you know, re reevaluate their relationship with the sport and mm. take a little bit of a, a breather and then, and then reattack it later once they're in a healthier spot. One more thing I want to talk about before we dive into Western States and I'll preface it by saying there are a lot of us in the sport that use running to either cope with or manage struggles with mental health. And you've actually pointed out some research in a recent post that in certain ways, this sport can actually be dis disadvantageous to our mental health, detrimental to our mental health. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's hard to say if the sport's detrimental to our mental health or the sport draws in people that have a little bit of a background in mental health disorders. Yeah. Um, but I think the one big thing that we can say, and this is from a paper by Jill Colangelo, um, it was her thesis actually looking at the mental, the prevalence of mental health disorders in ultra trail runners. Um, I think the biggest thing we can take away from that is that physical health doesn't necessarily equal mental health and that, you know, there's been, she's been showing that there are just relationships between changes in training volume and basically like number of races and all of these things in relation to negative mental health outcomes. And so more research needs to be done in this space. But yeah, I think in general, you know, if you go to a doctor, they're going to look at you and say, Hey, you're in prime physical health. Why are you here? Yeah. But I'd say that that actually works to a disadvantage because a lot of people, even if they are physically really healthy, might not be a mentally all there. And I think we just need to be more cognizant of that, of the prevalence of that in these kind of high achieving athletes and really think about that when we're treating them, whether that's through like primary care or through coaching or anything like that. Super fascinating. Okay. Yeah. I promise we'll definitely do a round two at some point. Um, let's definitely transition to Western States here though. Um, you're a veteran of this race. You, you raced this last year. You got a top 10. Um, I love to talk about like before and afters. Can you talk about your training leading up to this year's event and maybe how it was informed by some of the lessons you picked up from last year's race? Oh my gosh. Sure. I, I almost chuckle when you call me a veteran because I don't know if I <laughs> consider myself a veteran. Uh, so yeah, I ran Western States last year as my first hundred mile and my first go at the, at the race. And I mean, to say I learned a lot would be an understatement, but I would say that going into last year's race, my training was not ideal. I had a couple of injuries flare up from some bad ankle sprains pretty much during peak training. And so a lot of my training was on the mountain bike. Um, hmm. but I got there with a pretty sound mental status, you know, not any injuries <laughs> and enough fitness to, to at least push myself, um, to finish and to stay positive throughout. Um, but the things that I really messed up on were uh, aside from the preparation. So obviously, you know, lack of preparation, yeah. but also like the fueling and cooling mechanisms and just like the crew organization, because like, I didn't go into my crew, like strategy with any sort of informed like decision making. And so I, I kind of just won it because I was like, mm. Oh, it's like a 50 mile times two. So I'll just have my crew be there with bottles and then I'll just take them and leave and it'll be super easy. <laughs> and you find out quickly that that's not necessarily the case because you know, if you can eat a gel for 40 miles during a 50 mile race, but then the last, sorry, but then the last 10 miles, sorry, that was Jade. Um, the last 10 miles, your stomach kind of turns. You can probably gut that out, you know? But if you only can eat gels for 30, 40 miles of a hundred mile, <laughs> that doesn't end very well. And so, so this race, I'm really going into it with, with a lot of new things. So first off, my training's been really, really good. I've been training pretty much solidly through since last Western States with a nice little off season in the winter and have got a lot more climbing and descending under my belt, even before the big peak training. And then luckily I got to spend two weeks on the course. So I've ran like 70% of the course multiple times, um, just during the buildup and ran like 45 miles of it with 11,000 feet of descending with no quad pain, which is awesome. No quad soreness. Whereas mm. last year by mile 40 of the race, my quads were already sore. So I'd say just in general, my fitness and my training going into it has been a lot better this year. 
Um, but then the second and third thing are, are around the crew and around the fueling and cooling strategies is that we've just implemented more of a plan. And then in my previous races this year, I've just been really focusing on fueling. And so after Western States, I've raced Sonoma and the Gorge 50K, both of which I was really adamant to just finish them, not on empty, mm. to finish them fueling the entire time and to elicit patience like I'll have to elicit during Western States. And, and I think that training has been really, really good for me. And then, yeah, my crew, I'm just going to put a lot more faith in them to know what I need and not try to be, you know, a stubborn runner at mile 80, trying to tell my crew that I think I know what I need, even though, you know, clearly at mile 80, my, my opinion should not matter. <laughs> yes. I love that strategy of working to not finish on empty. I think that that's rare in our sport, or at least it just hasn't been spoken about enough. And that's an awesome objective. How are you feeling today? We're about a week removed from the event. Um, are you feeling good? Like, are you absorbing the training, feeling yeah. relatively rested? I feel super antsy, <laughs> which is funny because I've only been in taper for, you know, like four or five days. But I'd say um, when you're putting in a ton of hours into training and everything, it's it's weird when that's cut in half. Right. And so mm. I would say this week I've been a little bit of a roller coaster in my mental status where one day you feel phenomenal. The next day you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm so out of shape. The next day you feel phenomenal. You're kind of on a roller coaster because you have all of this extra energy all of a sudden an extra time. Right. To think. Yes. And that can be to our demise. And so I've been working just a lot on like settling the mind and um been focusing a lot on sauna training so my fitness feels really phenomenal the sauna training's been really good for um my pacific northwest self because it's been 50 to 60 and raining here every day <laughs> um but it's also been a really good time for me to try to like clear clear the mind and really just center the mind and and try to like stay calm mm. because i think that can be the worst thing you can do in the middle of a race like western states when it's really really hot and you maybe feel a little bit out of control is to get panicky. So mm. um, trying to center the mind, especially with all this extra pent up energy this week has been my number one goal. And I think it will help a lot with the race. And you have a new sponsor this year, right? Yep. Yeah. So this year I'm running for ultra and it marks a big uh, step in my career, I guess. It was kind of a scary step where I actually left my job uh, in February and now I'm full time. Uh, runner and taking, you know, a little class and doing the podcast, but in general, putting a lot more time and effort into running. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I stopped working as a scientist for Nike, stopped running for Nike in February and signed on with Ultra. And I'm really excited with this partnership. Um, they seem to really care about my story as a, as a human and as, as an athlete and, and all the work I'm doing as a scientist. So I'm really mm -hmm. excited for what's coming with them. And, um, it was actually really timely the week that I announced my like partnership with them. They had come out with a, with a new campaign with Kara Gaucher around body image and all these yeah. things. And so it's just, it, it worked really well for me because our, our values are really aligned. Um, and they're really, really supportive of, of me having a, a full-time athlete job and putting their faith in me to be able to, you know, really show myself in the sport with, without having to balance so many things. Very cool. Well, I want to close with this. I know that you are super passionate about the fight for athlete justice and uh, you have a recent quote. You don't want to keep reading about the girl who, quote, could have been, end quote. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about this new narrative that you want to see emerge for female athletes and what role you see yourself playing in that. Yeah, I like to joke that that's the real reason I run. Um, I guess it's not really a joke, though, but but yeah, I think for a long time, we've been fed this narrative, right? And and as young girls, we're really hungry for a narrative. We look up to these these professional athletes and we really absorb what they say. And so if mm. they tell us that they don't get their period and that's normal and that's what marks their success, we're going to shoot to do that. Or if we just see the after photo of someone who's worked for 10 to 20 years to get to a certain level, we're just going to shoot to be like that person irrespective of their journey. And so I would love to just change the narrative to be a lot more realistic into what the journey looks like for a lot of athletes and how that journey can be super different for everybody, but can still result in really high level achievements and really high success. Um, and so I think just, you know, acknowledging the ups and downs of training, acknowledging the mental turmoils we all go through, um, we'll really just start to change that narrative. So women aren't trying to put themselves in these little boxes, mm. but instead they're acknowledging that 
they might fit into a totally different box than the other person, but that doesn't make them any less of an athlete. Mm. Awesome. Well, Keely, I cannot wait to follow your Western States race a week from today. We're super grateful for your time. I'll make sure to link to all of your social media in the show notes. Is there anything else that you want to leave the audience with before we go? Nope. Just everyone who's at Western States, give me a good heckle when I, when I run through any of the aid stations. So I'll be looking forward to feeling the energy there. That's awesome. Well, thanks again. <laughs> thanks.